falling down around me. Welcome you again. I want to welcome everybody who's watching by way of video on YouTube or Facebook. I showed this contact information last week, but we had a little bit of technical difficulty, so it didn't wind up on the video that we posted, so I wanted to show it again. As it says in the graphic, we'd love to hear from the people who watch our videos. Uh, we'd also invite you to join us if and when you're able. Uh, again, thank you for taking the time out of your day to watch these videos. So I know you, I, you can't tell by the weather that it's December, right? Amen. We're getting close to the end of the year. Am I the only one that finds that incredible? Time flies. It's been a very busy year for many of us, and it just seems like time goes by more quickly than it has in the past. But we'll get to 2024 soon enough. For now, we're going to continue with the series Old Testament in the New Testament. For those watching the recorded video of this message, the, cho the title I've chosen is Pay Careful Attention. You see it in your bulletins. I'm going to be reading from the book of Hebrews again today. I, I mentioned last Sunday that this is the same book that we're working our way through in our Wednesday night Bible study. And also, the Old Testament verse that we'll find quoted in the New Testament popped up in our men's discipleship group yesterday. Uh, I don't count these as coincidences, church. So for some of you, all of this is going to sound very familiar because we've covered it so recently. And again, I don't find it coincidences. I'm convinced that when particular parts of Scripture start popping up in our lives, there's a reason for that, a Holy Spirit reason for that. You've heard me say over and over again, if it's repeated, it's important. And I don't just mean in Scripture. I mean in our lives. If it pops up in our lives over and over again, I'm convinced that the Holy Spirit is trying to give us a message, trying to teach us something. And I'm also going to say that repeating things applies, that principle applies to this sermon series. The things from the Old Testament are repeated in the New Testament. And there's a reason for that. So as I mentioned, if you're following along in your Bible or on an app, I'm going to be reading from Hebrews chapter 2, beginning at the first verse and through verse 9. It says this, We must pay the most careful attention, therefore, to what we have heard, so that we do not drift away. For since the message spoken through angels was binding, and every violation and disobedience received its just punishment, how shall we escape if we ignore so great a salvation? This salvation, which was first announced by the Lord, was confirmed to us by those who heard him. God also testified to it by signs, wonders, and various miracles, and by gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. It is not to the angels that he has subjected the world to come, about which we are speaking. But there is a place where someone has testified, What is mankind that you are mindful of them? A son of man that you care for him. You made them a little lower than the angels. You crowned them with glory and honor and put everything under their feet. In putting everything under them, God left nothing that is not subject to them. Yet at present, we do not see everything subject to them. But we do see Jesus, who was made lower than the angels for a little while, now crowned with glory and honor because he suffered death, so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. That's quite a passage of scripture there. And as I make my way through this message, you'll see that the title and the Old Testament quote or the Old Testament text that's quoted here, seem to be centered on two different things. My goal is to tie those two different things together in our minds and in our lives. That we would take these things from here and put them in, into action. Obviously, the title I've chosen comes directly from the first verse that I read. We must pay the most careful attention, therefore, to what we have heard 
so that we do not drift away. We've talked about the meaning and importance of one of those words in that verse, and that word is therefore. It means in consequence of that, or as a result of, or consequently, in this instance, what immediately preceded that verse, in what we know as chapter 1 of the book of Hebrews, is what I talked about last week, the superiority of the Son. If you weren't here, or you haven't seen it, the video is available on YouTube or on Facebook. And the central theme of that message is that God made His Son Jesus superior to everything and to everyone, including the angels. That's important as it relates to the first few verses of Hebrews 2, and it'll be important as we move even deeper into our text this morning. As a result of the fact that Jesus is made superior to the angels, we must pay more careful attention to what we have heard. What the writer is referring to as what we have heard is the saving grace message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We have to pay attention to that church. Not just hear it, respond to it, and forget about it. We have to pay attention to it. So let's break down more of our text. And before we do, let me say that those who are in our Wednesday night, our Wednesday evening Bible study group are going to have a little head start on understanding this. For since the message spoken through the angels was binding, and every violation and disobedience received its just, just punishment, how shall we escape if we ignore so great a salvation? As we studied on Wednesday nights, we came to the conclusion based on other things in Scripture that the message spoken through the angels is the Old Testament law. Angels are messengers that God uses to reveal His will to man. I know that when we think of Moses and the law, we think of Mount Sinai and the Ten Commandments, and nowhere in that biblical account are angels mentioned. What's referred to here is the entire law, and we find two instances, both in the New Testament, which mention God's use of angels in delivering the law to the Israelites. In Acts chapter 7, verses 52 and 53, Luke quotes Stephen as saying, Was there ever a prophet your ancestors did not persecute? They even killed those who predicted the coming of the righteous one. And now you have betrayed and murdered him. You who have received the law that was given through angels, but have not obeyed it. And in his letter to the Galatians, Paul writes in chapter 3, verse 19, Why then was the law given at all? It was added because of transgressions until the seed to whom the promise referred had come. The law was given through angels and entrusted to a mediator. Since the message spoken through the angels, what we've identified as the law was binding and every violation and disobedience received its just punishment, this text says, how shall we escape if we ignore so great a salvation? What does it mean to ignore so great a salvation? It means, according to this author, to not take it seriously. It means to not pay the most careful attention to it so that we don't drift away. Listen, I know I'm not the only one that's in this situation, but if I don't pay attention to things, they're gone. It's very easy. If I don't drift away, that information might drift away if I'm not paying attention to it. We see that this salvation was first announced by the Lord, by God Himself, through Christ, 
It was confirmed to us by those who heard him. That's the apostles. And God himself testified to it by signs, wonders, and various miracles, and by gifts of the Holy Spirit according to his will. By inspiring the writing of the scriptures, and by giving the apostles and Jesus the power to perform these signs and wonders and miracles, and by making Jesus superior even to the angels, God has left no doubt as to the person and the purpose of Jesus Christ in his time here on earth. Next, the author, after once again mentioning angels, seems to completely change the direction of his writing. After focusing on the supremacy of Jesus and the salvation that's only available through him, he goes on to write this. And this is where we find our Old Testament text quoted in the New Testament. Beginning at verse 5 of Hebrews 2, it is not to angels that he has, said, sub, that he has subjected the world to come about which we are speaking, but there is a place where someone has testified, what is mankind that you are mindful of them? A son of man that you care for him. You made them a little lower than the angels. You crowned them with glory and honor and put everything under their feet. And there's that humility again, huh? <laughs> what we read there is verses six through, in verses 6 through 8 is a direct quote from Psalm 8, verses 4 through 6. But to understand the context of that psalm passage, we have to include another verse. We have to include verse 3 of Psalm 8, and when we read it all together, it says this, When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is mankind that you are mindful of them? Human beings that you care for them. You have made them a little lower than the angels and crowned them with glory and honor. You made them rulers over the works of your hands. You put everything under their feet. In other words, considering God's greatness, why does he care so much about us? Why are we even on his radar? Why does he give us a position of dominance over the rest of his earthly creation? I'll tell you why. It's because that's what we were created for. God created man to be caretaker of the earth. And let's not leave this part out, church. God created man to be caretaker of the relationship between him and God. He did that because he loves us. Everything God does is motivated by his love for his created. Guess what? That includes discipline. Following the quote from Psalm 8, the author of Hebrews concludes this part of his letter with this explanation. In putting everything under them, God left nothing that is not subject to them. Yet at present, we do not see everything subject to them. In the beginning, everything on earth was subject to the rule of man. Then, the fall, the introduction of sin and the wages of sin, which is death. Man is still crowned with honor and glory, and man is still ruler over the works of God's hands. That hasn't changed. However, because of disobedience, man has no control over death. We see that in the world around us. Each human will be subject to death. Each of us will face the end of our human lives. The good news is what the author writes next in verse 9. But we do see Jesus, who was made lower than the angels for a little while, now crowned with glory and honor because he suffered death, 
so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. We still have no control over death, but we have Jesus. I'll take that anytime. He's the one who not only suffered death, tasted death, the text says, but who also defeated death. While man still rules over the physical creation, Jesus rules over the spiritual. Jesus rules over eternity. Because Jesus willingly fulfilled his role in God's plan, he has been crowned with honor and glory. As I said at the beginning, I'm aware that the Old Testament quote in the New Testament and the title have taken that I took from the first verse of Hebrews 2 seem a little disconnected. Therefore, which means what? As a result of that, I'm going to do my best to attempt to tie them together in a way that makes sense. And I feel like it's obvious that the first few, in the first few verses, in referring to the message of salvation, the author is considering the complete message of salvation. What I mean by that is from the first messianic prophecy in Genesis all the way through. That's the message of salvation, is it not? I believe it goes beyond the scope of the first century testimony about Jesus. I'm convinced again, based on the fact that the letter is written to the Jews, that the author is thinking all the way back. These are God's people. These are the people who for generations concentrated on the Old Testament scriptures. Because that's what they had. That verse that's considered the first hint of a needed and promised Messiah says, and I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. That prophecy and all the others that are fulfilled in Christ are testimony. Testimony of God's faithfulness concerning the promise of salvation through Christ. It's my humble opinion that the author is suggesting that we must pay the most careful attention to every word in Scripture. Not just the ones we like. Not just the ones that make us feel good. But every word. I've mentioned numerous times that it's one of the reasons for this series. To understand any of it, I'm convinced we need to have at least a working knowledge of all of it. God's original plan was for us to rule over the works of his hands forever. Again, because of disobedience, death entered the equation. Death, the one thing man had no control over. Why do you think that is? Why do you think Jesus had to live and die as fully human in order to defeat death? Why didn't God just say, okay, no more death? Why didn't he just remove death from the equation? Let's go back to the beginning of Hebrews chapter 2. In verse 2 it says, For since the message spoken through angels was binding, and every violation and disobedience received its just punishment, how shall we escape if we ignore so great a salvation? What's the just punishment of ignoring so great a salvation? Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. 
That's a choice we get to make. The gift of God is the great salvation mentioned in this passage. And what we can't escape if we ignore so great a salvation is the wages that we've earned by ignoring it. That consequence is death, church. We've been given a choice because God loves us so much that he offers us a gift. What we must understand and what we must pay careful attention to is what we've heard. We all know that a gift isn't a gift until it's accepted, right? God wants us to choose to accept the gift. Jesus became a little lower than the angels for a time so that death could be defeated and so that the debt of sin could be forgiven. I think that's really good news. I think we need to pay careful attention to that every single day. Because I don't know about you, but there's people around me that could drive me the other way if I don't pay attention to that. So here we are at what we call the time of invitation. If you've never come to the full realization that you are in need of a Savior, because that is indeed where it starts, isn't it? If you've never accepted the gift of salvation available only through a relationship with Jesus, and this is important, a relationship that establishes Jesus as not only Savior, but as Lord. He's in charge. God invites you to do that right now. It's, the invitation doesn't come from me. It comes from God through His Son. Scripture teaches that you can do that through confession of faith, repentance, and baptism. And we are prepared to offer the opportunity for you to take those steps here today. Or whenever you're ready, but I would urge you not to wait. As for those of us who have already taken those steps, I want to remind you of something. We must pay the most careful attention, therefore, to what we have heard so that we do not drift away. Let's pray. God, we love you so much. We thank you for your word. We thank you for tying the two covenants together so that we can better understand them. We thank you for writing all these things down. We also thank you for the, thank you for the living word who is Jesus, for his sacrifice, and for the gift of salvation and eternal life that you offer to each and every one of us. I just pray if anyone can hear my voice and they've never made a decision to allow Jesus to be Lord and Savior, to get a repaired relationship with you through him, that they would make that decision sooner than later and that we as your church would be here to support them and to walk with them as they begin their journey. Pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.